Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's IFAM seminar. My name is Judy Moskowitz. I'm a professor and vice chair for scientific and faculty development in the Department of Medical Social Sciences here at Northwestern. Um, before we get started, just a couple of notes. Um, please be aware that we're not gonna be monitoring the chat during this seminar. If you have questions for Alex, Dr. Cihogios, please use the Q&A function and we'll do our best to answer them during the Q&A section at the end of the seminar, if time permits. Okay. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alex Sihogios, a passionate psychologist, dedicated cancer researcher, and champion of adolescent and young adult health. As an assistant professor in the Intervention Science Division in the Department of Medical Social Sciences, and a full member of the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center, she's on a mission to help young people navigate cancer treatment and medication adherence or sorry, to navigate cancer treatment and thrive after their diagnosis. Whether she's studying how digital health tools can improve medication adherence or creating social media movements that empower AYAs to prioritize self-care, Dr. Sihogios blends cutting edge digital health science with a human touch. She's developed innovative interventions that leverage mobile technology and social media to support adherence to oral chemotherapy all while ensuring that young patients' voices are central in the design of those solutions. Dr. Sihogios is also the co-chair of the AYA Cancer Research Committee at Northwestern, driving forward efforts to enhance outcomes for this underserved group. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alex Sihogios. Hi, thanks so much, Judy. Hi, everybody. I can't see you, but I see your names. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I'll go ahead and share my slides. Um, all right, Bye. play from start and Judy, I can see you. Can you see my slides? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you all for having me. Um, I'm delighted to be here to share a bit about my research, um, which as you heard is focused on adolescents and young adults or AYA with cancer. Um, and it's a digital health research program. And today I'll be talking about research, particularly focused on improving oral chemotherapy adherence. Um, these are our funders. Um, some learning objectives just to guide us as we walk through. Um, one, we'll talk about both the benefits and the challenges of digital health for addressing AYA health behaviors. Um, I'll talk about one intervention that involves a just-in-time adaptive intervention. Um, so you'll learn a bit about um, what that is, what the methods are, and what can be challenging about developing this type of approach. And we'll, I'll um, talk about a separate line of research focused on um, improving oral chemotherapy adherence in a different space on social media. Um, so for the non-cancer researchers in the room, um, you, this slide is to tell you why this outcome is particularly important um, to individuals who have a leukemia or a lymphoma diagnosis. Um, for for um, young people who have um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, once they enter a remission state, they must take a once daily oral chemotherapy called 6MP to prevent a relapse. And so this is a maintenance oral chemotherapy meant to yield a durable remission. Um, the Children's Oncology Group, which is part of the um, National um, Clinical Trials Networks, which organizes oncology clinical trials across the United States and beyond, um, did a study looking at children and teens with uh, lymphoblastic leukemia um, evaluating their oral chemotherapy adherence. And what the study showed is that when um, young people were less than 95% adherent to this drug across about an 18 month period um, total, but the study just spanned six months, um, they had a nearly three times greater risk of cancer relapse compared to those that were above that threshold. Um, that's a pretty high bar for adherence. Um, most of us in our lives have experienced non-adherence to medication, whether that be an antibiotic or birth control or something else. But here we see that adherence um, is particularly essential for maintaining that durable remission. And what the second figure shows in the blue line are, are individuals who are over the age of 12. 
and the dotted line were individuals who are younger than 12, um, who conceivably have more parental involvement in managing their medication. And we see a steeper decline in oral chemotherapy adherence among those teens, um, which is a pattern we see really across chronic disease groups that the developmental strivings of adolescents and becoming more independent and appear affiliating with peers and so on um, can pose understandable challenges with managing a long-term health condition, including in this case, oral chemotherapy. Um, so I had a postdoctoral fellowship from the American Cancer Society um, back when I was at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And at the time, you know, the study about oral chemotherapy adherence had come out, but there were still so many questions of why AYAs, adolescents and young adults struggle with cancer related adherence. Um, prior to this study, frankly, there was sort of this assumption that cancer treatment is just so important. Who would, who would miss it? You know, like what, why would we even need to study this in the first place? Um, so in this study, we sought to really just um, begin to answer and unpack the question of why, like what gets in the way for AYAs in particular who are receiving cancer treatment and prescribed medications, but also a million other things like diet recommendations, physical therapy, et cetera. Um, and this study didn't include any particular cancer diagnosis. We took anyone who was either getting um, chemo or radiation and we did surveys and interviews. We interviewed patients, their parents, their clinicians to really get that triadic data. Um, and what we found quantitatively is that AYAs who missed a medication related to cancer in the past week had higher rates of depressive symptoms, worse health-related quality of life. They described more medication barriers. Their families had more difficulties with family functioning, like communicating with one another and their caregivers reported more financial stress. Um, and I put this up here because I think we often, um, when we think about the concept of adherence, the first intervention as a psychologist and provider, you, you know, we think of as like setting reminders. And here we see a much more complex picture that there's multi-level factors that can interfere with taking um, cancer-related medications. And then quantitatively, when we interviewed um, a purposeful sample of 30 triads, we heard similar things. Like for example, um, we heard about uh, 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 symptoms. This quote from, comes from a patient, like two days after chemo, I can barely drink water, so I can't even swallow pills. So when I need them the most is when I physically can't take them. And then the quote at the bottom came from an oncologist who said, um, you know, the insurance doesn't cover it. It has to come from a male pharmacy who doesn't have it. You have to make 12 phone calls and get a prior authorization. And then the family is just not going to do it. The health system is just too complex. Um, and this maps nicely onto self-management theory, which really guides my research program, which highlights uh, multi-level factors that can impact medication adherence and then ultimately outcomes like um, remission status. Okay, so let's pivot to digital health. I mean, this slide I always think about deleting because a lot of it is pretty intuitive um, for anyone who knows a, a teen or young adult or who was one at some point in their life. You know, obviously there are um, pretty intuitive opportunities with using digital technology to reach and engage young people. Um, I mean, we're all on our phones a lot, but young people are really on their phones a lot. Um, we see in health interventions that digital approaches are often acceptable and feasible and preferred. We could intervene potentially in real time, like at the time, for example, when someone is prescribed their medication. Um, we know that um, impacting health during the AYA years impacts in the moment health, but also has long-term implications as health behaviors often consolidate and get pulled forward into adulthood. Um, and then AYAs also experience unique systems factors that interfere, um, can interfere with their health and health care, like, for example, changing insurance status or transitioning from a pediatric cancer setting to an adult setting, transitioning from an academic medical setting to a community setting. Um, so all these transitions um, lend its way for digital interventions to potentially bridge gaps. Um, and <laughs> digital health has an implementation problem, I would argue. Um, we know in um, health research that our traditional interventions can span decades to move from feasibility trials to implementation trials, and many patients have to wait a long time before receiving evidence-based beneficial um, behavioral health care. Um, but I would say that there's a particularly strong mismatch between this slow pace of research and technology. Um, if we can imagine that it takes 20 years to for say an app or something like that to make its way to the public and have an impact. Um, technology changes so dramatically. Um, 20 years ago, um, I was a, a teenager and our, our 
technology, for example, was MySpace. Like if we built this 20 year research program on that, we would, we would be in trouble. Um, and many digital health interventions, while we make this assumption that we're meeting young people where they're at because it's on their phones, it's actually not the technical environment they use every day because we're requiring them to adopt and use something new on their phone, an app or something of the sort made by us researchers and clinicians. Um, so we grapple with these questions. How do we get young people to sufficiently engage with something new, say an app that's exclusively about a health behavior? How do we then compete for their attention with all the other things that they're already using on their phones and in their lives? And then how do we tr um, foster trust with messages that are created um, by us and, and not necessarily members of their community? And for example, um, in the app intervention that we've been developing over our five-year NCIK-08 award, um, we're just in the beginning phase and this has taken five or so years. So just highlight how long this takes. Um, and um, I would say to achieve equitable public health impact, we can't wait till the end of this translational process to consider some of these implementation challenges and continue to operate under this assumption that because young people use their phones, they'll definitely use our digital health <laughs> interventions. Um, and if you wanna read more, um, Andrea Graham, Megan Lane Fall, and I published this viewpoint a couple of years ago in JAMA Peds where we um, unpacked a bit this implementation challenge and um, provided some recommendations for using um, human-centered design to increase um, uh, engagement and uptake of digital health tools and accelerate this translational pipeline. Um, so, Briefly with this slide, I um, this is kind of my lens and approach to this adherence research program. Um, one, the things that impact adherence, while we often focus on between group differences, these things that we found early in our research, like mood and symptoms, um, vary not just between AYAs, but within AYAs from day to day. Um, so we think about that a lot in our program. Um, we also um, adopt this idea, which many of you probably adopt, that like one size fits none. Um, and so we need to consider different approaches and personalization to fit the needs of individuals. Um, and again, digital health is so promising, but implementation will be challenging. So we try to address this proactively, even in the, the stage that most of my work is in, in, in the pilot stage, in a few ways. Um, one, community partnerships. We'll talk about that. Co-design approaches. So we'll talk about that. Um, and I'll also introduce a personaliz how we optimize personalization through an experimental trial design called micro-randomized trials. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll explain two adherence interventions we've been developing. And frankly, I didn't set out to develop two interventions about the same thing, and hopefully they'll come together at some point. But I think it'll, you'll um, see sort of how and why these two things work together. Um, so our first intervention is called ADAPTS. It's a standalone app that we've been developing in my lab as a part of my NCIK award. Um, and this came from a, um, a program of research where we first conducted an ecological momentary assessment study to better understand these time varying factors that can impact adherence. So things that change from moment to moment, day to day. And then we um, embarked on this um, human-centered design process to develop and, and soon to pilot um, a just-in-time adaptive intervention. A just-in-time adaptive intervention, um, I think when I wrote my K was like really like the new thing. And now I think probably people, um, you may have some familiarity with these methods, but um, just to explain a bit, the just-in-time piece comes with this idea of delivering the right intervention at the right amount, at the right time. And perhaps maybe what's left to the side a little bit is also thinking about like how we minimize waste. So times when we're pinging people through a digital platform at moments when they don't actually need that reminder or prompt, um, or maybe when that reminder and prompt wouldn't work for them anyway, like say they're driving or something. Um, so we wanna eliminate these unnecessary disruptions and really focus on things um, that have precision for changing the health behavior. Um, the just-in-time is also important because it provides support for things that um, change rapidly. And so if an intervention, for example, is meant to maybe get someone to come back to clinic once a year, that might not be the great, um, a great uh, test bed for a just-in-time adaptive intervention because it doesn't happen as often. Um, but for something like taking a medication or being physically active or smoking where different things that happen during the day can really influence whether or not that thing happens or not, a just-in-time approach could be helpful. The adaptive part is all the inputs we get to decide what to do. And so that can come from surveys, um, frequent brief ones like ecological momentary assessment or EMA, 
as well as sensors. Um, we use, for example, electronic pill bottles that have a sensor in the cap to track openings as a proxy for medication adherence, but other studies use GPS and other things. And so we use those inputs and develop decision roles to essentially decide what to do. Um, so here's a really simple version of a just-in-time or JEDI decision role for adherence. We might say, measure when the medication is due. If they're outside of the home, we'll send a reminder. And if they're at home, we'll do nothing because maybe when they're at home, they're more likely to take their medication anyway. So that's a simple example. You often hear about just-in-time adaptive interventions and micro-randomized trials together because micro-randomized trials are an optimization trial design for these JEDIs, um, not an intervention design. And so we have to do a micro-randomized trial to really um, flesh out what these decision roles need to be. Um, and so micro-randomization trials involve, um, are different than our traditional um, randomization of groups. And here we're programming into an app a randomization probability of receiving, for example, a type of message. And that's really based on the individual level. So as a user of the app, for example, I might have a 50% probability of receiving this type of message on any given day um, that's independent from um, what somebody else might get. Um, and so with a MRT or micro-randomized trial, we can answer questions like, is a certain type of mobile message beneficial across all different kinds of contexts? Like our reminder is just helpful no matter what. But we can answer more sophisticated questions like, under what context is a certain type of message most beneficial? Like maybe it's helpful to get a medication reminder when you're out of the house, but if you're at home, it's just like encouraging you to like habituate to the reminder and not pay attention to the app. And we can ask questions like under what conditions is one type of message more beneficial than the other? So do certain things only work when you're already in a good mood or something like that? Um, so in our ecological momentary assessment study, uh, we used an app, an open source app that was developed in an academic setting. So if you like this, um, this does not belong to me. As long as you have a programmer, anybody can download the code and use this. Um, and so once a day, participants got a reminder to complete a survey around the time they took their medication. Um, within the study, we embedded a micro-randomized trial of engagement strategies. Um, while our primary focus was getting this data about what on any given day could impact adherence, we thought what a great opportunity recognizing that AYAs, people don't engage with our mobile health tools as much as we think to test out different strategies to bring them back to do another survey. Um, so one of those engagement strategies, you see this cat, um, was like, was funny memes, which are AYA centric, of course, but it was meant to be a non-monetary extrinsic reward that sort of is pleasant and um, doesn't cost anything uh, because EMA studies often pay people a lot to get them to do surveys, but that's not necessarily the most scalable model, especially if the survey itself is a part of our intervention, as in the case of a just-in-time adaptive intervention. Um, and then this virtual environment got more complex with these animals and facts about them as they did more surveys. Um, this is a really busy slide and I, I, I don't wanna um, push it on all of you, but like um, just to show you the schematic of the micro-randomized trial that was embedded in this essentially survey study. Um, and so we tested these different strategies, um, inspirational quotes coming before the time the survey was sent to prime them that was coming, this extrinsic meme as sort of an, uh, something pleasant. Um, we also tested intrinsic reward at what we called an altruistic message that reminded them that their participation was helping other adolescents and young adults. And then they got very small amounts of money. Um, and this was a six month study because we wanted to capture adherence across that six month period that the children's oncology group had studied. Um, but we knew that people, we thought people probably wouldn't complete surveys every day for six months, even if they were super brief. So we opted to do this burst design where the surveys came on and off at certain periods so we could sample different periods across that um, six months. Um, and so this was um, the first MMIK, and we had um, 28 patients and 26 of their caregivers because we included them, recognizing they're often engaged in medication adherence with their with their son or daughter. Um, so we um, they did some brief surveys as well. Um, here's some demographics, um, perhaps to note that um, uh, we had a, a fairly diverse sample, including nearly half with primary public insurance, and that our average adherence rate across that six months fell below that threshold of relapse 
uh, prevention, which we kind of expected. Um, over 3,000 daily surveys were provided by the 54 people, which is good because in this type of work, you get your statistical power, not just from the number of people, but by the number of observations. And um, our, some of our main findings were that, um, for example, flares and symptoms impacted adherence at the um, within-person level. So when a patient demonstrated a two-unit uptick in their own um, fatigue uh, or an uptick in their nausea, they were less likely to take their medication that day. And also factors like communication with their parent related to better adherence across all time points. So that was um, sort of not unrelated to sort of what was happening that day, just an average effect. And we also found um, that people had okay engagement over the six months. Um, it, it declined over time, but remember we wanted to see if we could keep them engaged without paying them a lot. And actually our month one engagement was similar to a prior pilot study we did um, despite much lower in incentives. And so when we looked at the M MRT data, we found that when people received a meme after completing the survey the next day, they actually were more likely to come back and complete a survey, which is kind of interesting. Um, but that was a moderated effect. And so it worked for these um, individuals on weekdays, but not weekends, which AY is a really busy on the weekends. And receiving that inspirational quote also brought them back to do another survey but only if they were on a roll. So only if they had already been um, engaged in the intervention, it kind of kept, kept them engaged. Um, so these are very exploratory, but starts to answer some questions for us of like, are there ways that we can increase engagement uh, with digital health tools? So um, I'll pivot again. So um, from this study, we got some insights of like, if we were to deliver a tailored adherence intervention to AYAs, what would we tailor on? Um, but Maybe even more interesting in my view, we started to ask AYs, what do you want in an intervention, um, digital or otherwise, and how can we co-develop this um, together? And so we took an approach called human-centered design, um, which you can see involved three waves of iterative design cycles where it begins with really um, divergent brainstorming thinking where the possibilities are a little endless at the beginning. We want to generate really freely what um, this community wants and needs in an intervention. And then we work together to identify key app features and design requirements, broadening again, having them prototype, um, user test those prototypes and refine, and now preparing to deliver that in a trial. Um, and so this is where our co-design came in um, with about 19 AYAs and their, and their caregivers. And this is what our app now looks like. It's getting ready to be um, implemented in a, in a pilot um, where individuals, AYAs complete once daily surveys again. So we iterate off the same app base and they um, now get a contextually tailored message. This one is tailored to days when they feel less motivated to take their medication. And there's some other cool features too, like um, we integrated that sensor ECAP to the app so they can pull their data right in and visualize it, as well as there's a companion um, caregiver app to get at some of the dyadic communication that needs to happen with adherence. So as we were embarking on this human-centered design process, um, we started to hear quotes like this, um, because I know when you're stuck in the hospital and isolating, you don't get to see that there's hundreds of patients in the hospital. We're all in bed taking the same medication. We have experiences we can share. Another quote um, is an individual sharing with us that um, what would really help her with her adherence was to know that other people were in the same situation and maybe recording a video of it and so on. Um, and so we started hearing this pretty early in our app design. And uh, honestly, my first instinct was like, oh my gosh, they want us to create a social media platform. Like this is a K award. We don't have the budget to do this. And um, and then I think true to the human design spirit, you know, we have to be responsive to what the community is telling us they want and, and need. And so that got us thinking, well, maybe instead of designing a social media feature within our app, we could leverage the social media communities that already exist for AYAs. That brings me to the second approach. Um, we call it the AYA Oncology Self-Care Movement or AYA Awesome hashtag. Um, and uh while I'm a digital health researcher, um, you know, we see that, of course, the majority of teens are on social media. Um, there are good and difficult things about that, and that's what the research would support. Um, and that um, 
while we sometimes in research speak about minoritized populations such as Black and Hispanic youth as hard to reach or difficult to engage in the research process, we see that actually these minoritized populations are using social media more um, than, than white teens. And so this also, I think, is important for us to think about when we think about the equitable reach of the information and, and tools that we're sharing. So who are social media influencers? And we use this term influencers a bit um, tongue in cheek because it's kind of like a known term. I'll say that the community partners we work with um, wouldn't necessarily think of themselves that way. Um, they're really digital cancer advocates, people that use their experiences and social media platforms to share information and support with their community. Um, and so uh, influencers exist in um, every sort of sector of life right now. Uh, it's, you know, skincare, et cetera. Um, but in AYA cancer communities, these are actual patients who've undergone cancer treatment as a, in AYA. They post about cancer and they have thousands of followers. Here are some of our community partners. Um, they're diverse. They reach a pretty wide audience. Um, Natasha Allen is in the first TikTok and you'll see that church, that post got over 100,000 likes. Um, and so the content that they post is about cancer and by virtue of being from their perspective tailored to AYAs, but they're also creating from the ground up a network of AYAs on these social media platforms. And I think that's really important because AYA cancer is a relatively rare disease. Um, when you meet and work with this population, you hear things like, I'm sitting in a clinic filled with younger kids or older adults, depending on where they're seen. I don't know anyone my age with cancer. I feel like I'm the only one. And so um, separate from, you know, I think clinical efforts, research efforts, this is a ground up community um, approach where these networks of AYAs connecting with one another on social media has really been facilitated by them and for them. Um, all of our partners share a very similar story with us that they started doing this content because when they were diagnosed with cancer and looked for AYA specific resources, they struggled to find anything. And if they found it, it wasn't particularly authentic. Um, and so that drew them to creating um, content themselves. So we did a very early um, like very early pilot study where we um, tested the feasibility of partnering with um, young people to co-create adherence TikTok videos. And we disseminated them publicly through those influencer platforms, as well as through our hospital-based account. And just naturalistically saw what happened. And we saw um, it reached over 30,000 people, not all of which were AYAs, but it seemed to be some because of the comments were things like, wow, this really helped me. I got bad results from a PET scan today. I really needed this. Um, so we, I've been grappling and thinking a lot about this question. What if we could spread credible cancer information and support via influencer partnerships that don't require AYAs to find and use something new, including our app? Um, we can harness the power of authentic patient narratives because TikTok-like videos, whether created on Instagram or TikTok, often feature a person. And while these social media approaches are contemporary, the idea of narratives and changing health is not, you know, this is an established approach. Um, and it really leverages the ecosystem that AYAs already use for information seeking, where they're looking up information about mental health, health, other things on places like TikTok, and really wanting to hear it from their peers, and in fact, engage more with messages that feature their peers. Um, as I mentioned, these influencer networks could potentially facilitate reach of AYAs across location, treatment setting, and point of care. These networks already exist. Um, and the, as you saw in the slide I showed with our partners, their identities can represent diverse groups that are often not captured in mainstream cancer communication. Um, it's, it's, it's hard enough, frankly, as an AYA to see yourself in sort of messages from, um, you know, agencies, you know, well-intentioned agencies like American Cancer, you know, like because they're just not focused exclusively on this age demographic, um, but even harder to see uh, diverse individuals in the messages. Um, and so we have taken community engaged research in a digital space and really conceptualize these young people who are content creators as community based partners. Um, and before we embarked on doing any research together, um, 
we have been building capacity. So first and foremost, that's involved pay. <laughs> we pay for every meeting they attend and we pay for every hour they spend co-creating content with us. Um, and that's in thanks to a grant from Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. We spent time getting to know each other, their stories, what brought them to social media, where they're at in their cancer right now. Some are survivors, um, some are still in treatment. We practice because it's an ongoing skill, power sharing and, and deferring to the community on, for example, new directions. Where should we go next? Um, what what are What's your priority for your platform? Has that changed? Um, we have to communicate and collaborate. And for working with young people, that means like, a uh, group chat, a text message chain, you know, is more effective on than an email, for example, and, and facilitating accountability and trust. Um, we've done things like we've co-presented at conferences, which I've, um, you know, paid to have a partner travel with us. Um, we've um, published together, conceptualizing them as co-researchers on our team and brought tricky comments from reviewers back to them to see what they think. Like, for example, on a paper we published, one comment was like, can you provide us a list with all the influencers in the AI cancer space? And they were like, absolutely not. Don't do that. And here's why. And, you know, so really um, integrating these young people into parts of the research process other than, um, you know, being a participant. So we published this paper earlier this year, which really sort of um, describes why we think this could be a really meaningful partnership for improving cancer care delivery for young people and some of the tenants of our partnership. And then I'll um, conclude um, with a little bit of our pilot work. So up till now, it's been kind of theoretical like this. We think this could help, you know, but we wanted to see in an early pilot, um, is it possible to partner with um, our community advisory boards of, of influencers to co-develop an intervention and, and deliver it on social media. So a social media enabled intervention, is it acceptable? Is it feasible? Where are the ways we can improve? Um, and I underline low touch because this is meant to be a very light touch adherence intervention um, with the idea of scalability at the forefront. Um, you know, if something like this could impact adherence, we could deliver it to a lot of people um, using platforms they already use. Um, so our pilot is a fairly simple design. It's non-randomized um, because these patients are seen once a month. That's the length of the study. And so for 14 days, we get a baseline assessment of their adherence. And then 14 days, they get once daily um, message that we co-created with our community advisory board. That's a social media message. I'll show you some um, that cover different um, empirically supported adherence strategies, um, but from the their point of view. Um, the, those messages could either be delivered via a direct message on Instagram from a study created account or text message. Um, it's a little messy, but we wanted to give participants choice at this early stage for a few reasons. One, we often think that text message is the most accessible way to communicate. Um, so we wanted to see how many people would actually prefer to get it on social media as opposed to that, like, um, that approach. And then some measures of acceptability and to see if we have any early signal of change. Um, one of our community partners also developed our flyer. So you see how beautiful it is um, because many of the young people we work with also wear many creative hats, including being artists. Um, here are some of the content. Um, the first you see is like a very engaging medication reminder um, created by Chelsea Gomez. Um, I'll play for you two TikTok-like videos that are meant to target different things. The first is really meant to provide some emotional support about being in this phase of treatment where there's really not much mention about medication at all because you remember early in the talk, I said things like um, depressive symptoms, et cetera, can impact adherence. And so we're trying to foster that emotional uh, support and connection to sort of get through treatment. The next is showcasing a very simple adherence strategy, which is when you leave your house, you should take extra medication with you in case you're away longer than you think. Um, so I'll play both of these videos. Um, so the first one should one, and here's another one. So it says at the bottom, realizing I forgot to take my meds. I left my love in San Francisco. That's a really engaging way of saying like, take extra meds with you. Um, and then this one here is another static image, um, which is just kind of in a font uh, format that AYAs use when they um, are posting on social media, but it's sort of 
asking the question, well, what is this? So it's educating, but in like sort of that really sort of normal uh, way that AYAs, uh, you know, post things on Instagram. Um, so we, this is small. We have 14 patients in the study so far. 11 have finished the study. Um, you know, our focus is on feasibility of recruitment, um, acceptability of the messages. Um, interestingly, um, we're seeing this covered about 60% people referring, preferring to receive the messages on Instagram instead of text. Um, we have a diverse sample, about half um, from a minoritized racial or ethnic background. And again, seeing that um, our average adherence is below that relapse threshold, which we always see in every um, study we do. Um, we are seeing higher engagement than we typically see in digital health studies. Now, this is a pretty short window, two weeks, but when they are received on Instagram, um, about 85% um, are of the messages are seen, meaning they looked at it. Um, and we're hearing in our exit interviews things like I'm sharing con I'm sh resharing that content with my friends and family. Um, even for participants who don't feel like they need it, like they're like, I would have taken my medication anyway. They're like, but I always went back and looked at the message because I was curious. So um, we're really, you know, I think hitting the mark on engagement and we're seeing good acceptability. Um, over half of our samples so far is saying that the messages rescued doses of medication that would have otherwise been missed. Um, and in the exit interviews, I think the most pervasive theme is this, that this person says, I would say it made me feel a bit calmer about myself, about my situation, that I'm not the only one. Um, and so it's sort of the human in me is like, if we never change medication, I hope we do. But like, this is really important to the AY community, this feeling that you're not alone. Um, one participant in our study um, sadly did relapse, um, and that was an adherence, thought to be an adherence-related relapse. And when the team talked to her about it, she said the only thing that ever helped her with taking her medication was what was the study, um, which is sad and, and you know, important. Um, so I'll conclude. So we leave a little time for questions. Um, I'm like competing with a lawn mower <laughs> outside, so sorry if it's been a little loud. But um, so we have two early stage digital health interventions, each developed with it, AYAs that differ in modality and different in intensity. We have our app, we have the social media. Um, there's strengths and challenges with each. Our app allows us to deliver really personalized treatment. Um, there's multiple features in the app, the messages, ways to track medication, et cetera. It's a controlled environment where we can, um, you know, um, I think for like in the context of an RCT, that's a, that's easier, right? Um, the challenge is how do we then make the way through this translational pipeline? So this app, um, as quickly as possible, if it's effective, could get into the hands of AYs who need it. Social media, um, it's highly engaging. This is an untraditional way to deliver health interventions. Sometimes I think getting funded in this space can be a bit tricky for people who aren't used to thinking about health interventions this way. It's not, it turns out, built for RCTs. Like there's, very, you know, the methods here are really tricky to figure out and um, we're, we're learning and starting to unpack this. But I think if we want to get content, evidence-informed content to AYAs as quickly as possible, we can see the potential strength of this. Um, thus far, our social media pilot is showing that we are succeeding, where digital health interventions can often fail, engaging AYAs. We think that these partnerships with young people on social media have the potential to address other disparities that AYAs with cancer face. So we have proposals submitted or in progress related to pain, mental health, survivorship care. Um, but there's many more questions to answer. I'm very humble that these are early stage research, right? Like we're in the acceptability, feasibility stage. We need to um, optimize these interventions, determine actual effects, you know, and, and um, conduct an RCT. Um, related to our partnerships, we think about the toll it could take on young people to consistently create this cancer content. Um, we've heard that. We don't, no one has studied that. Um, and and the um, these content creators in cancer um, are one example, but we're finding in talking to other colleagues and to other disciplines, these communities exist in other chronic disease and mental health groups as well. Um, and we don't really have great questions about like the qualities of the social media health content that are the most persuasive to AYAs as a whole, but also within so certain sociodemographic subgroups. And so if we're promoting this idea of an equitable approach, are we making sure that the messages 
are appealing to the right people um, equitably and also reach people instead of say just reaching, you know, white white females on on Instagram or something like that. Um, so with that, I'll end here and just say thank you. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there, there are any. Great. Thank you, Alex. What a great talk. Um, I always love hearing about your work. I always learn something. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please type them into the Q&A. And um, while you're doing that, I'll take facilitator's prerogative and ask the first question. <laughs> sure. Um, so there's there's also no way for me to ask this question without sounding old. So I'll just ask it. <laughs> so the social media platforms that you're mostly focusing on now are um, TikTok and Instagram. Yeah, we've used um, mm -hmm. we've used TikTok as like a way to generate messages, but not necessarily deliver them. Um, in our pilot, we've focused on the Instagram direct message as a approach. Um, there's of course policy that could yield a TikTok ban in the next year, which could change some thinking around that. Um, though all of these social media platforms now have really converged in the types of features they offer. Like you can create, for example, a TikTok like video on Instagram. They just call it reels instead of TikTok. So anyway, yeah. so that's yeah. also like, I think where we once thought platform maybe was um, like the platforms were very distinct. Um, they all tend to offer very similar features now. Uh, so if there's a TikTok ban, I think there's still probably power in um, video-based messages. Great. And is it, I mean, my perception is that sort of the digital health intervention delivery space moves and changes really rapidly. So like, are there social media platforms are sort of on the on the rise or do you find that hard to keep up with and how do you keep up with it I think that's where the community partnerships come in play like having young people um who are in this right they're creating content they're um in that age demographic um I we you know I think originally sort of thinking this as a way to how to make our, I think originally I was thinking how that maybe these partnerships can help make our app more engaging because we're getting sort of the, that um, input from people in the community who are doing digital things that are reaching a lot of people. And then we sort of started pivoting like, well, why are we making something new? But um, anyway, I think that's where the community partnerships become so critical because um, then we can iterate more quickly. Um, just as one example where it's taken like years, plural, to develop our app, um, we created over 30 social media messages targeting adherence in about a month with our cab. Like it didn't take very long. There was refining and selecting certain messages that capture different health behavior change features, but the act of, you know, they create very quickly. And so um, it's a little bit, um, it was a lot faster than, you know, so I, I can imagine as we work through this, that could be a strength that we can iterate more quickly. It, um, in response to whatever is happening now. So we have a question in the Q&A. So from Jen Brown. Hi, Jen. Um, and they say, great presentation. I appreciated your discussion about building capacity with the influencers you work with. Can you share any more concrete examples of ways you worked on power sharing and accountability? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, uh, I mean, Jen, thank you so much. Um, I I see this as something to practice. And so I feel like I don't have, um, I'm not like 100% skilled on this. I mean, simple things like we meet once a month and I try to, um, we collaboratively set the agenda. And sometimes the agenda is like catching up and you know, like it's, like, I think as researchers, we're so like product oriented and like research oriented that allowing us to take a step back and follow their lead. Um, we, uh, we also like, for example, we just did an interim, uh, like survey to try to like take the temperature of the group. Like, how do you feel like we've been doing on, um, being inclusive and equitable and incorporating their point of view into the research directions? Um, 
we like in a, of course, like a soft money environment, I need to submit a lot of grants. So another way is like, well, what do you want to, what do you think we should do next? Like, you know, we could think about, we did the small pilot together. We could take those methods in lots of different directions. What's your priority? And frankly, there's is mental health above and beyond any, of you know, so we're starting to incorporate that into like, well, we could submit a grant on this, but let's do this first. Um, um, I'm trying to think of other, oh, probably the best example I can think of too is when we um, expanded our group, we went from three members to six. Um, I asked them how we should do it. And their preference was that they, everyone would nominate a person that they thought would be a good member of our group. And then we all brought it to the group and took a look at their pages and what everyone knew about them. And then they decided who we should send invitations to, which is something I've learned along the way that it's not just my relationship with the cab, but it's the cab's relationship with each other and feeling like this is a safe place for all of us to work together. Um, but I think I still have a lot of room to grow and learn and trying to build that. A question from Adam Becker. I'm interested in the community engaged component. Did you do any training or capacity building with partners to build a foundation of knowledge about the research process in general or just focus on their engagement in key elements that they already understood well. We I'm wondering how this would happen over digital platforms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we meet on Zoom. Uh, I've met some in real life, but not all. Um, we haven't done a formal training. That might, um, that probably would be good if anyone has recommendations. But um, I would say like, one thing I'm, uh, I pay a lot of attention to is the, things in academia that we come sort of almost so naturally to us that we don't think to explain it to people, especially like even just publishing together, for example, when we include them as co-authors, there's so many forms that get sent to them. They've never seen these forms. They're sort of confusing. They don't have a necessarily academic affiliation, so they don't know what to put in that, you know, so I don't, I think perhaps a formal training would be good. We haven't taken that route yet, but recognizing the places in which the research process is just so hard to understand and um, taking the time to explain it. And um, and my coordinators on this call, Kevin, we do a lot of work to make the process as easy for them as possible. Um, Great, thank you. Um, so I have one more question, so I'll ask Yeah, you. sure. Um, you mentioned the funding challenges with yeah. this type of work in particular. So, Funding aside, if you were given millions and millions and millions of dollars, unlimited funding, what would be the study you'd want to do? I think, in, I mean, I'm going to, um, I, I've always done health behavior research, but um, in response to this, uh, what I've learned and what I think, what I believe these influencers are already doing with their platforms, whether we study or not, that they tell me, I'm like, you sure? Like, I think you're... For, they're making an impact with or without us, I want to say. Like, I believe that to be true. If you hear about the comments they get, the millions of messages they get, they're having an impact. But they really want to put data to this to show the community that, like, what they're doing is making an impact. Um, I do think mental health is um, is the next, like, if I had a million, like, I, yeah. I that would <laughs> more be than a million. More yeah, than a million. Yeah, Let's more than clear, a million. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's so many things, like, even CBT, for example. Um, now, this is low touch, but there's concepts of CBT that can be taught in bite-sized ways. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it does matter to see someone like you explaining that or modeling that. And if there were ways to do a study um, to adapt those CBT principles, for example, but through this different modality, I mean, I sort of liken it to the same way that we've adapted mental health treatment to be implemented in schools to meet AYs where they are, or primary care. Like, can we adapt it to meet them where they are in these digital spaces? And so if I had lots of money, I think that's what I would really like to do next. Um, also in response, and both in response to the community's priority and from our pilot and adherence, like the major themes are mental health related. Like this is making me feel less alone. I finally feel like somebody gets what I've been going through. Um, so I think, that if I had the money, that's what I like to do. But that's great. Yeah, that sounds awesome. All right. Any more questions? Looks like we might be all set. Thank you so much, Alex, for this.
incredible talk. Um, I'm sure you'll be getting follow-up uh, contact around the, the studies you've presented. Yeah, please do. Um, feel free to reach out. Thank you, everybody.